All right. Uh, next up, we've got Dr. Misty Blowers from the Air Force Research Lab. Misty is one of the creators of the Security Conference for Genetic and Evolutionary Computing. Probably the first person I've ever met doing machine learning work in security. Is that where to go? Uh, Misty, you're up. Uh, 
uh, the data mining platform because it really goes through every step of the way of integrating different data types together, extracting the most meaningful information from that data, sending that information to the learning system, which we explored multiple different learning systems in the last talk, you learned a little bit about duty scanning and I'm going to talk mostly about communities in this talk, but we also explored duty scanning, which is very promising result. And, um, and so, the summary supervised learning system um, is very helpful. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be summary supervised learning. So, this is a dump that came into the mail. Um, I know it's a little intimidating. You can go down and look at this and have some fun that you've got to develop the model and take the raw material. This is a simplified process diagram. As I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a DCS system, which is different from the CAD system, which we find in a system. Because it is um, contained at this location. However, there are vulnerabilities, there are attributes to the DCS system. And my prior um, job, I worked as a equipment supplier for the different teams. And I actually, as an equipment supplier, had access to uh, mills around the country to kind of look remotely and see how their plant was operating. I could have maintained a monitor of the vendor of kind of looking at the So I love this picture here. This is like, um, concept of screening uh, data. I'm trying to extract meaningful knowledge. Depending on the historian, he records information from all the different controls that cause this process. We initially narrowed it down to some two central points, and this is by the astronaut and engineer himself, and from the astronaut and the operator. The granularity of this collected data to go as well is uh, four seconds. And so if you think about when you're changing your model to characterize the behavior of the environment, and you have two years of the data, the four second instance, you're dealing with quite a lot of, of data. So I use two years of data, uh, some of these questions, five instances, what I found to be the answer in my language. And then, of course, the operator on the side. And I spent a lot of time in um, learned that there were a lot of countries that were not happy. There were some countries that were lacking, but they were not um, to think that it was worth a couple of dollars to make it feel comfortable. There were some countries that could have been upgraded to be um, a little bit more sensitive to um, the variability in the process, but there's so much kind of how that can help you to put on why it's important to make that something that you should probably want to do it. And the leg in the lead time um, can be able to do that. You have about two hours of time for raw material pumping until end part of the week. So, in this particular model, I was using information from multiple points of process in the interaction plan. So, if you're thinking about something goes wrong with a pump on the front end, they do have the ability to allow a buffer of storage so that you can turn on the back end until they get some up and up and up front end. But now you've got this huge disconnect between when does this product that is being stored in this tank uh, fully be on product on the way. So if you kind of build a model, you really need to take that stuff in the And the operators are simply aware of different disturbances that are not detected by these sensors. The operators know, for example, that when they go out to the plant and they do a wash down, that they're going to get different readings than when our plant is running. 
So not to last you to read these charts here, but with every control loop, you have an output as you can manage the LMS. You have a process value. You have the step point. You have the step. One of the things that I found interesting about sometimes was when you adjust that status at the beginning of the value, it really says, do I have it in the manual operation or do I have it in the automatic operation? But because of the way Subnet targeted that programmable logical controller and really got into that ladder logic, I heard that we need to have a manual operation for this Subnet kind of So that's why we feel that using Information to multiple things to cost your process, combined with information about the quality of the product and the improvement of the inside facility, is really what you need to be able to have this type of um, aspect of the inside. So again, this is a little bit more about the control alignment and um, any error in timeline is a very good type of concept. So variability is found in um, a person who's building this model in the time of the field itself. And it's not just the difference to the S kind of variability. I um, understand that in the tone of the team, you might have a different blend of pseudo entities to it. Um, you really try to optimize that process to S kind of return on your investment. And uh, although it's probably a little bit frustrating, it's still going to be very well. Um, and very easy to operate in some of these things in part of the community. Um, faulty machinery, faulty sensors, people not calibrating all the kids. We're going to talk a little bit at the end of the talk about operator response. And you go from one shift to another, the operators might respond in a different way to different um, events that happen out on that operating floor. So let's talk a little bit about machine learning for baseline machine learning. Supervised learning, uh, I've never used any supervised learning tools. Uh, and then unsupervised learning, um, we talk, they talked a little bit about this uh, in the last uh, talk. That's possible. So in supervised learning, we have labels, information, we have, we have trying to characterize a car, for example. This isn't a good example because they're all the same type of car, but if you use different types of cars, you might use different features that lead the car to go 159 miles per hour. Another set of features allow this car to go on here to female power. And so then when you're presented with an unknown vehicle, can you predict how fast that vehicle can go? Unsupervised learning is learning by association. So you don't actually give the labels, you just allow the learning mechanism itself to decide how fast that vehicle can go. So supervised learning is um, used to trace for the variables. We actually um, were able to identify the key principal points that manifest the circular variability in a successful problem. There's some um, faulty equipment that imposed some inherent vulnerabilities to the system. And the stuff we're still in our mind is in front of the system. The first part of this was actually taking the different sets of ports across this process and correlating that to time when the state of health of that set of process is poor. And to do this, we use the correlation analysis and then we put the port actually up on the screen. It basically, I won't go into that too much here, but it basically looks to see. Um, for all the different variables, variables that you're considering, if you're trying to predict this output, which of those variables affect that output variable the most? And then, if you train your artificial neural network, and you have your input to the system, you get the perfect one to train your variables, you have the event 
is heard, if it's coming to take down the process environment, or it's uh, to predict off-rate products. Um, you set your learning algorithm up in such a way that you look for these correlations, and you set up parallel networks, and then you attempt to do them after you take them So, the investigator tends to find guidance variability at the end of the analysis. In this case, we actually identified a central point where if they do things that with a more sensitive sensor, they use the variability of the data set and there's a lot of the bottom line as well. So characterizing the behavior of the product is itself. Uh, the stock is about for event detection. What's interesting about this is it allows a per event adjustment of performance. So, in a lot of these cluster analysis uh, techniques, we see almost uniform clusters uh, develop. And what we did here is we said, okay, we'll cluster on the time when we know that the state of health of the industrial facility is poor. And then, for certain areas in that case that are characteristic of events of high interest, we actually adjust the threshold bounds around those uh, clusters so that we're reducing the false alarm range and we're, in some cases, increasing the detection for certain events of interest. So this is our capability across many different domains, and we actually have a patent on this. Um, to be able to do this, to do a prioritized detection of events because of that amount of data. And why is this an advantage of the current state of the art? The current state of the art um, has a threshold down set of these different pressure points. And when you're doing the construction of the structure process, you might have an alert that tells you when there is a, um, a single point across that process has exceeded a threshold bound. It is a combination of these different locations across the process that you really need to take into consideration as a whole because it's even more global rather than localized to what's going on. So we're going to break this down in a minute. But this is basically an overview of the flow of the okay. We have the operator log. Um, we loaded in simultaneously with the training data. Now, the training data is from the plant stage itself. And why this is so much surprising is you do have it labeled to say what is the state of health of normal operating conditions, and then which of these, um, which of these data set represents times when the state of health of the industrial process is poor. And along with that, you have the information coming from the operator log, which lines the different timestamps in which the operators have reported information about what they think has happened when there's a failure in the industrial process or when there was a significant event that occurred, and they give their account of what they believe happened, and then it's loaded into the proper system. Alright, so let's go through the system a little bit. Um, correlation analysis. Uh, we use some statistical uh, measures to look at the um, way these different features, uh, these different sensor points across each mill, the mill, um, compared to the alpha variable, which was the data health of the process. And we found it most helpful and most robust to use something as far as um, biology. From biology, they call it a seed map. And what you're basically doing there is you're looking at comparing the two classes of information. You're comparing when the state of health is good to when the state of health is bad. And you're looking for the minimum and maximum bound in each one of those classes. And then the T test will actually look to see how many times the bound of the one class exceeds the bound of the other class. And by doing this for each and every variable, you start to see which variables are providing the most class separation. So this gets into the data mining. 
what features are the most important. Our last speaker talked about principal component analysis. We tried that and did not find that to be uh, as helpful and as robust dealing with um, that variability in the system as the two tested. And then I think the question came up in the last uh, presentation as well about the case, uh, how do you determine the number of clusters? We had another component within our uh, software that we call the K evaluator, which is the look to uh, the compactness of that cluster and um, run through the training set to see how many optimal cluster sizes we need. So, although this in case is not defined yet, um, <laughs> this is something that a plant operator might use. You see that they're presented with what we call a two relative strength. And what this really is telling you is the features that we deem most important to be able to make a prediction when certain events of interest are going to happen. And what we think is of value to the operator in this particular uh, interface is that the operator can select the top ranking features, but they also can select maybe a point down here that didn't rise to the top so that they can um, explore some different possibilities. So again, this is some exercise learning. Uh, we get these initial threshold values um, for the test determination by doing a um, optimization, a multi-adjective optimization method, where we're, our initial threshold values look to minimize the number of false alarms and maximize the number of detections. So if you can imagine this in mind, we're not just mapping into the small case of the the time from the fair house is poor, we're also mapping into the time from the fair house is good. And so this is all taken into consideration when we uh, the threshold are in So this is a little bit more clarification on the case. You see, you've drawn globes around the different clusters. And we show the pie chart to kind of depict the fact that we have a mouse over, over any particular point within these clusters to tell you which piece you were selecting um, for that particular point, what those pieces values were. And also, this is, these pie charts are kind of attribution per, on a per cluster attribution. So, if you have a cluster um, that's forming here, you have cross-referenced the information that you've gotten from the operator to make this pie chart. And you can go in and you can look and say, okay, historically, when the state of health is as the current state is, this is what the operator reported as being the issue. So, as an end user, you might want to expand the threshold around that particular region. Because maybe this is super important to you, whereas this region, yeah, I kind of already knew that that's something that happens, and I'm going to minimize that because that's not the kind of thing. So, now I'm going to find a part of the case that I've heard. It's okay, this is a TV algorithm. It does do this random initialization and slowly move the means of the cluster until you get this optimal result where the closest um, points of secrecy are gathered around the mean values. And again, these clusters in this demonstration are pretty spread out. So we did we had much, much more data, and we did a measure of cluster compactness and value. So again, back to the threshold optimization, after collecting the data and training clusters, the validation step is performed. 
you get it in scientific class and it's kind of tricky. I think that's the key thing. And that's one of the jokes that we especially around. So right now, again, we expected this brain to help us out with our interfaces a little bit because this isn't uh, necessarily what we were coming. But right now we have slide rules. And for each cluster that forms, you can actually adjust the special bounds to the full side rule. You can double click on the cluster number itself, which brings up that um, visualization that we can do. So incorporating the expert knowledge was significantly important in the future. The operator then has loads for this per event resolution. Um, the probability is associated with the positive capacity of events to the empirical knowledge that allows you to analyze the factors that the special bounds, which we found to be very important for the end user has the ability to use the system. And this is uh, currently with the output of the uh, out. It gives you the event that occurred, what did cause my event, and the likelihood um, of that cause. So, in these test scenarios that we have here, these weren't a result of a cyber attack. They were a result of multiple things in the structure process that could have taken the process down. In order to actually simulate and build these models around what was happening with the cyber textures, we would actually have to have that data with no one to our knowledge has access to the data. <laughs> so, you can use inside a threat, both intentional and unintentional. Um, characterizing after the response, uh, we developed some software tools to determine if the after action may have influenced the difference in rates either for causation or prevention. So we looked at um, the different shifts. We actually developed some algorithms to be able to help us automate this process. And when an operator actually sees that data from automatic to uh, manual, we could see what actions they took and whether or not that caused an event to occur. So it's a pretty nifty little thing to do, um, especially as you do find the system. There might be an operator out there that, you know, uh, needs a little bit more so in conclusion, this was presented um, how to establish boundaries for behavior-based industrial and engineering systems. Um, tools like this may help to the defense for uh, different studies and different systems. And the cleaning methods for learning operators and industrial classification uh, allows defense engineers a localized control of these tools um, and gives them valuable insight into the process. So I had two years worth of plans and came on that. So, um, you need to have, in order to use this type of tool, you need to have some historical knowledge to build the model. However, you can have a feedback loop, which we don't have in this process yet. Um, we rely a lot on the human augmentation of these models to help us determine how these uh, clusters were adjusted depending on what their uh, prioritizing might be.
That's interesting because we are actually the same as our own. So that's why I say that how to use quality measures incorporated into models are important. So if you were to do something like that in this type of environment, it's now it's environment but if you were to do something like that in this type of environment, I believe that you see a degradation of cost quality over time. Uh, so that incorporation of those online quality measures of the actual material used to be found is important to improve the value and to apply it to the development. Yes. <laughs> so that's why again the quality measures are, are important. And cost processing, cost processing the online quality measures. To use offline quality measures that you can use in the lab code. So there's going to be a lag there, right? And there's not a time that you would actually detect that you have to detect that something's going on. But what you're saying is perhaps people discuss that and the fact that they look and that programmable lab controller is giving the, it, it was giving the information that it should be giving. It was giving the accurate information that it should be giving. So, the multi-point observation of the process would help uh, reducing risk and um, something like that with something that can be used. And also, designing that with these quality measures would help. Did I answer your question? Can I use what? No, we have not done that. We basically have this is wealth of information and no, but that would be like an exception to have someone um you know, yeah. 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 Now that your research is uh, publicly available, do you know of any industrial locations that are There's a lot of bugs we need to work out before we can actually hand this off to the industrial system. We work closely with this mill still today. Um, and we actually had an uh, effort starting up over the next few months. Um, the lab is looking to be using a lot of their technology to do this So we actually have two students that are going to look at um, they will be working on the bugs that we put on and um, and we will be Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.